Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH Event Space. You are tuned into our third and final of our event spaces we're doing on photographing the upcoming solar eclipse. We're here at the final hour. Hour. Russell Graves, join us. Russell, what's going on? Hey, not much. Just traveling today. How are you doing? Doing great. So you're outside of the usual Hackberry Farm location. I am. I'm at a new property I've got called Redlands Ranch, and there's, there'll be a lot more about that later. So I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome. Well, I'll get ready to turn it over to you, Russell. Um, okay. I will remind all of our viewers that we're going to be taking questions. I see we already have some questions pouring in, so don't be shy. Make sure to get your questions in. We have a ton of solar eclipse con content that we already have uh, live on the channel. And if you do not know about that or the rest of our content that we do put out on a daily basis, live Monday through Thursday, you can head over to our event space, YouTube. You got me all tongue tied over here today. I'm, I'm so excited, but uh, a lot of information to come. Um, Russell has been a regular here on the event space platform. So make sure if you like what you're seeing over the next hour, check him out. You can check him out and just look up event space, Russell Graves. You'll find plenty of workshops there. Russell, I'll turn it over to you and I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. Very good. Thank you. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think this time, because I am traveling, my my camera is, I think it's going to be best if it just gets turned off in a second. But I'm going to share the screen right quick. Hang on. Here we go. So, I think everyone ought to be able to see that. Uh, now, welcome, everybody. Uh, like Derek said, my name is Russell Graves. Usually I'm coming to you live from Hackberry Farm at Dodge City, Texas, but I'm in a different part of Texas today. I'm working on some other stuff, but uh, I think Derek said it when, when he said that he's pretty excited about the eclipse and everything's coming up, because I know I am too. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I, I, if, you, if, you, uh, if you get my newsletter, you read this story in yesterday's newsletter, but the story I told was when I was in uh, kindergarten, uh, and I'm, I remember, I don't remember much about kindergarten, but I do remember this story that our teacher took us outside to look at a, an eclipse one day. Uh, and this was way back in 1974. And when we were looking at it, I remember her saying that, you know, because it was a partial eclipse at the time, I remember her telling us that there would be a total eclipse in the year 2024. And my little brain at that time couldn't wrap my head around how far in the future that was. I couldn't, you know, Obviously, as a five-year-old, couldn't imagine being the age I am today, and it just seemed like so far away at that point. But then all of a sudden, here we are. It's 2024, April, almost uh, April 8th, 2024. Uh, I, I, I tell you what, to say I'm excited is, is really an understatement. So today's topic is Eclipse Basics. You know, I, uh, I, I think in a way, or, or it's Eclipse for Beginners, I think in a way, we're all kind of beginners at this because I've seen eclipses in the past. I've photographed them in the past, but this one being, especially in Texas and a lot of the United States, we're going to be in complete totality where it's a total solar eclipse. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. So even though I'm experienced at photography, I'm experienced at all kinds of photography, the eclipse photography, if I'm being honest about it, I'm a beginner as well. So uh, I'm going to share with you today, some of the things I've learned, some of the things that I've been working on so far to, kind of get me close. Some of the things I've read from other people who are a lot smarter than I am on some of the topics we're going to bring. So uh, as we go through this today, put your questions in the chat. We're going to circle around when we get finished. We're going to turn the video camera back on uh, so so you can see my smiling face. And we're just trying to save bandwidth by doing it this way with my camera turned off today. So with that said, a little bit about me. I always kind of do this every now and then. I don't assume that everyone knows everything about me. I'm a I'm a commercial and editorial photographer. That's what I do for a living. I'm a full-time photographer. Uh, what I mean by commercial is I don't do as much commercial work anymore, but I used to shoot ad campaigns for a variety of companies. And I still do a little bit, mainly in the agriculture industry is what I kind of work in now. I, I grew up in the country. Hackberry Farm is a mile from where I grew up out in the country. And so what made me fall in love with photography was all of those things with which I was most familiar. The rural life, rural lifestyles, cattle, crops, the wildlife that you find in rural areas. And so that's what made me fall in love with photography so long ago. So I've made my living around those kind of rural lifestyles. Also an editorial photographer. Uh, I still shoot for a number of magazines and really love the editorial stuff, but really love going out and, and telling stories with my camera. Uh, also a magazine and book writer. I, aside from uh, photography, that's what really got me into photography 
is I've always had a propensity to write. And so just being able to write, tell stories and uh, convey my thoughts on a, on a page for people to read, it, it's, that's been a good living as well. So, and I've written countless magazine articles and I've, I've had seven books published. Uh, and then here lately, I switched from doing commercial photography because I started doing workshops. Love being a workshop leader. The reason why I love being a workshop leader is because for the first 16 years of my professional career, from the time I got out of college at the age of 23 until I was 39 years old, I was a high school teacher, taught high school agriculture. And so I love teaching. Don't mean to pat myself on the back on this, but I, I won every major award that you could, or I won just about every award that you could win in my field. And so I love teaching. I love the process of sharing knowledge with people and really getting people excited about learning. And so I traded the commercial work about five or six years ago when I started leading workshops and just absolutely love workshops. That's really a full circle moment for me. Uh, I'm a hobby farmer. I always tout, I live on Hackberry farm. That farm has been in my family for 60 years where I'm the latest one in my family to own it. And when I say hobby farmer, I don't farm to make a living out of. I just farm as an excuse to drive my tractor around in circles. So that's what I do to relax. And then uh, finally, I'm a speaker. I, I get asked to speak at a lot of different places. And, uh, and have a really great time doing that because I, I was made to tell stories, both written and oral and with pictures. And it's just, I love doing that kind of stuff. And I don't think I put it on here, but really my most important job is I'm a, I'm a husband and a father of two. And that's, uh, that's what I really try to put my efforts on every single day to be the best I can at all these things, but especially being a father and a husband. Now, here's why I'm so excited about the, about the total eclipse. If you look at this little map of the path of totality in Texas in the red and the blue lines is the bounding boxes where you'll be able to see totality and the green line is the center line where you see that red star right there. That's Hackberry Farm. That's where I will be come Monday uh, with about 20 of my closest friends and it's going to pass right over us. We're going to have about four minutes of totality. So I'm pretty excited early on the uh, I'll tell you a little tip. This is another tip for when the next eclipse comes up. If you look at the long range weather forecast, if you go to like your, your weather channel app or AccuWeather, any of the apps you have on your phone, and you do like a 14 day forecast, those 14 day forecasts are generally based on weather averages for that particular day since records have been kept, because that's how they do. It's a probability. It's not actually what the weather is going to do. It's a probability of what the weather may going to do. And so all the, all the, People I know, including uh, some me some TV meteorologists in, in some of the biggest markets in this country that I know personally, will tell me three to five days is about the best they can do on really accurately predicting the weather. And even then, they get off on the timing. So I've been watching this weather for the past couple of weeks, and for a while, it wasn't looking very good. It was looking like it was going to be cloudy and rainy all over Texas. But as we get closer and closer, and they understand what the weather patterns that are coming from out west are going to do, Right now, the National Weather Service, as of about an hour ago, the National Weather Service is saying at Hackberry Farm near Dodge City, Texas, 20% chance of rain, but mostly sunny all day. But that 20% chance of rain doesn't come until that evening when the next storm system goes through. So knock on wood, keep my fingers crossed, all the things we got to do to bring us good luck. I am, I am hoping for as long as we can get past 2 o'clock and not have any clouds, that's perfect. I mean, I want to see the whole eclipse. But if we can just get that four minutes of totality where the clouds magically clear out and in the honor of, of, of the Easter that just passed in the, in the movie that used to show on TV every Easter, Moses, where Charlton Heston would part the seas for the, uh, for the for, part the Red Sea. That's what I hope happens to the clouds, if there are any in the sky during that time, during the path of totality. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. So one of the things I want to talk about is the basic equipment that you're going to need for this, this uh this total eclipse and the basic equipment or the big hint is you don't need a whole lot of stuff. DSLR or mirrorless camera. I think that's kind of a given. If you're really into photography, you're probably going to have that. If you don't, if you're not into photography, there will be some, if you don't have that kind of stuff, there will be some limitations, but you can still get by without it. Uh, a telephoto lens. And, and as I've been talking to people, that's what seems that they can't wrap their mind around. Cause a lot of people say, well, don't I need a wide angle lens or don't I need a, uh, or like a 50 millimeter lens. Well, if you want to get detail in the sun and detail in the Bailey's beads and the Corona that you can see around the sun during totality, you need a telephoto lens. One of the things that used to be 
pretty common that people would learn in photography, and it's not really talked about much anymore, but to make the sun or moon look to a natural size in your photographs, you can't shoot it. We see in 50 millimeters, but you can't shoot it in 50 millimeters. If you want it to look a natural size in your photos, you shoot the sun or the moon at about 200 millimeters. And so that's why I say telephoto lens, because to get any detail at all, you're going to need a, a, a telephoto lens. And I'll talk about that more in, in a little bit. Uh, and the, a solar filter. And there's a lot of different, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of different uh, opinions about what works. You know, you'll hear some people say a, uh, a, uh, a, you know, a, a neutral density filter, like six stop neutral density. I heard a guy earlier I was talking to today was saying a welding helmet. And I don't know if I'm comfortable recommending those, th those things. I'll, I'll tell you what I recommend in a minute. And this is based on a little bit of research. Uh, I recommend a tripod. I recommend a tripod for all kinds of photography, though. If you hear me talk long enough, I think a tripod is an essential piece of gear that everybody needs because it'll make your pictures better. You can handhold pictures of the sun during the eclipse, but to be able to track it and it's moving to the sky, uh, you, a tripod is going to be really helpful. A cable release or intervalometer. That way you're not having to bump the camera all the time by looking through it because as the sun moves, you're, you're going to have to keep tracking it. And just a cable release is good to be able to fire your camera without touching it. Intervalometer, if you want the sequence of, of the whole uh, eclipse, the stages of the eclipse, intervalometer is handy as well. A lot of cameras now have built-in intervalometers, so if you know how to use that on your camera, uh, that's great. If you don't know how to use it, then it, it might be worth looking into. And then I recommend this as well, an extra rig, uh, you know, just a, either a duplicate setup like you have and set up two cameras, or one camera with a, like a, say a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, like I'm going to have, then I'll have another camera with a 600 millimeter lens just for that detail shot of the, uh, of the uh, totality when it happens to be able to get a, a tighter shot in on that. And so the basic settings I've been finding out is meters you would any other subject. And then, and then depending on how tight you are on the sun, how zoomed in you are on the sun, uh, you're going to have to do a little bit of exposure compensation. And that says minus two on the exposure compensation. I don't think it really exceeds that from my, from my testing I've done so far. And when you see that minus, if you don't know what that means, what it means is anytime you see a minus on a meter, like if you imagine the meter on your camera, I shoot Canon, so it's in the lower right. It's got zero in the middle, and that's where the camera thinks the exposure ought to be. Anything to the left of that is on the minus side, and that means you're taking light away. You're letting less light in, so it's the, the exposure will be darker. And if you go the other way, it's to the right, it's letting more light in. So uh, you can do exposure compensation because that's how I shoot or you can, you can dial that in manually. But the point is, because when you put a solar filter on, it's going to make the sky so dark. You know, you're not going to be able to see blue sky anymore. It's going to make the sky, sky so dark, but you've got this dark sky with that bright, with the sun still going to be pretty bright shining through there, with that bright, bright sun shining on there. The camera, depending on how big the, the sun is in the frame, is going to tend to bias towards exposing for the dark areas around the sun. And so it's gonna to tend to overexpose the picture a little bit. And when you overexpose something, when you look at it, if the picture looks too bright, it's overexposed. And to be able to, to uh, uh, compensate for that, if it's too bright, you gotta take light away or minus, minus one, minus two in your exposure composition or compensation. And I'll, 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 again, I'll go into a little more detail about that as far as my recommendations for, for practicing between now and then. Now, here's what I was talking about on the on the solar filters, and this is after a lot of research. I don't, I, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable recommending neutral density filters because I'm, I'm just gonna. The truth is, I just don't know which one, how much is enough, and that's my ignorance. But what I do know is, uh, there's a I, international standards organization ISO, same people that that certify what ISO 400 or 100 means in your camera, says that in order to, to be safe to be able to look at the eclipse or the use on your camera, it has to meet that ISO 12312-2 standard. And so that's what I feel comfortable recommending to everybody. If it if it meets that standard, if the if the eyeglasses you're using to look at the eclipse or the filter you're using on the end of your camera or end of your lens meets that standard, I think I'm comfortable in recommending that's what you should use. In fact, come Monday when I uh, when I, I uh, have my workshop on my farm. 
and the people come there for that. That I've been recommending the filter that meets that standard. Pretty much, it's an inexpensive filter. Bought all of mine through B and H. They're uh, they they just use that little thin piece of mylar film, and they're kind of a they're made of cardboard and they fold together. I mean, you, when you look at it on your camera, it's obviously the cheapest piece of gear you have, and it looks like it's not going to be very functional at all. But the truth is, those cheaper filters are are pretty good. And so, if you haven't got your filter yet, I'd recommend run out and get it. But again, make sure it meets that standard just to keep your Keep your camera safe and the sensor safe on your camera as well as uh, as well as keeping your eyes safe. And another thing I, I just don't hear a lot of people talking about, and I may be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. When you magnify the sun with the telephoto lens, that's like putting a magnifying glass on your sensor. And so I would rather be safe than sorry in terms of the filter I use. So again, I think if you meet that standard, you're going to keep your equipment safe. You're going to keep yourself safe. And then wear solar glasses. Uh, I know in Texas, every little convenience store you go to, every every hardware store you go to, every store you go to has a bucket of glasses sitting by the register. They're selling them for $1.99. They're really, really, really cheap. Uh, but I recommend people getting them because I think it's important not only for you to take pictures of the solar eclipse, but I also think it's important for you to experience the solar eclipse by looking at it with your own eyes as opposed to looking at it through your camera. If you follow my instructions I'll give you today and you follow the setup routines I'm gonna talk about and the practice protocols that I'll talk about, you'll be able to still capture the sun and the eclipse, but it, I think it's worthwhile to uh, wear your solar glasses and just take, take it in for yourself. Every phase of the eclipse when you can. And enjoy it not only yourself, but if you've got neighbors there with you, enjoy it with your neighbors. I'm excited. My parents are 85 and 86 years old. They have never seen a total solar eclipse. So they are, uh, they're coming down to the house and going to set up lawn chairs with all of our other guests and, and be able to watch this uh, happen come Monday. Now I mentioned before, I'll tell you a little bit about where I think you should shoot. I, I think if you've got a one to 400 millimeter lens or a one to 500 millimeters lens, or even like the, I know Tamron and Sigma, they make like the 150 to 600 millimeter zooms. It's kind of a sweet spot on a focal range. I mean, it, it really comes down to how much detail you want to catch. Me personally, I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot again. I'm two two different cameras. One is going to have a bigger lens to catch capture the detail, and then my second camera I'm going to have is I'm going to shoot at 200 millimeters. And the reason why is I'm okay because that's a I shoot a Canon R5. I'm okay with having a lot of real estate, uh, a lot of empty space around the sun because later on it gives me a little bit of freedom to be able to crop that image where I need to. Uh, I can do the composite and I'll show what I'm talking about in a minute, a composite. I can do a composite image uh, to, uh, to, really to really illustrate the different phases of the, of the sun. So if you shoot all your pictures too tight, you kind of lose a little bit of the ability to crop easily. I mean, there's always some things you can go in and do, but uh, one of the things that, that, I would recommend too is is just shoot it a little bit loose one to 400 millimeters go out practice look at it kind of get a feel for what you like best and just stick with that and then I've been finding out with these dark dark filters I think for me the, the sweet spot is ISO 800 to a thousand is where I, I've been shooting my practice pictures at and I think that'll be uh that'll be adequate you know I'm back to the filter part I'm told by everyone that's done this before that during that four minutes of totality, if you're lucky enough to be under it, you can actually take the filter off because the sun, the sun will be behind the moon. It would be blocked by the moon. And so you're able to take the filter off during that time. And so uh, I think even during that time, you keep it at ISO 800 to 1000. I think at that range, it'll give you a fast enough shutter speed where you, even if the wind's blowing and your camera's getting a little bit of shake because of the, the wind, It'll still you can still get a high enough shutter speed at that ISO without having so much shutter without having so much ISO or shooting it at such a high ISO that you're going to start introducing noise into those dark areas of the frame. Now I know there's some things you can go to do to change that, but if you've listened to me long enough, I'm always a fan of trying to get every, as much right inside the camera as I can because the post processing part, albeit important, is probably my least favorite part of the entire process. Because at the end of the day, I'd rather be outside taking pictures than monkeying with my pictures inside in, inside my office when I could have gotten it right for the first time. So I say that to say there's a 
million different ways you can do this and get it right, but the things I'm telling you today are uh, are my recommendations. So I'm recommending ISO 800 to 1000. And so that same uh, degree, the aperture 5.6 to 8, I think that's where these lenses operate at their sharpest. And so that's what I recommend. You don't need a whole lot of depth of field because you're shooting at objects that are a few, well, you're actually, you're shooting at the moon, which is a few uh, hundred thousand miles away. The sun, I don't know how far the sun is. I think it's a few couple of million miles away. If I think about this, I should know that, but I don't know it. But anyway, uh, because of that, you're not really worried about depth of field, but I wouldn't shoot it wide open. And so if you set your ISO at say a thousand and you set your aperture to F8, then your camera, once you've got it pointed at the sun, is going to recommend what the shutter speed ought to be. And so again, it goes back to the first setting. If the, sh if the camera recommends one two thousandth of a second, then you know you've got to do a minus one or a minus two, whatever looks best on your camera and to your taste and be able to underexpose it just a little bit. So that's going to take you around to one five hundredth of a second or one one thousandth of a second. And that's plenty fast to be able to, to freeze the action. And that's a hypothetical, but you, you need to get outside and look at that. Uh, and then shutter speed is, like I just mentioned, one or two stops below what the camera's probably going to recommend you. And these are good places to start, but none of it can be just going out and working through the process and practicing over and over again. Manual focus is another thing you need to think about. Uh, because these cameras, when they're trying to acquire autofocus, they look at par parts of, of hard contrast between light and dark. Uh, and when you've got this filter on, that's going to compromise the camera's ability to autofocus a little bit. So my recommendation is shoot them, shoot on manual focus, uh, and then and then once you get your get your camera set up, manually focus on the sun. If you need to, tape the focus in place so it doesn't move. Don't just roll your lens to infinity and think it's going to be in focus because if you've ever shot stars at night, you know that's not necessarily the case. And the reason why it's not the case is the sun and the moon are not at infinity. They're at a finite distance. And so since we know they're at a finite distance, you can't just roll it over to infinity and think it's going to be in focus. I, my, my guess is it's going to be a little soft. So look through your camera, look through your viewfinder, whatever you need to do. Use the tools that are available in your camera, whether it's focus peaking or the little focus aid that a lot of these cameras have that, that will turn green when you have it in focus. And focus on that edge right where the sun meets the sky where you've got that hard line of contrast where the camera can really pick it up and uh, and 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 make sure it's in focus and then whatever you got to do, lock it down to lock it down, put tape over it or whatever. Don't put don't put duct tape. That'll leave a lot of sticky on your lens. Make sure it's like gaffer's tape or even if you're in a pinch, if you can't get gaffer's tape. Uh, I know painter's tape will work as well because it won't leave any any residue behind. But anyway, my point is manual focus, lock it in on that. So that way, if you happen to bump your camera or someone else bumps your camera, you don't lose your focus, and then you you don't you don't if you don't don't bother to check it, you don't want to end up with a bunch of fuzzy pictures after that. So that's one of the things you just need to constantly monitor as you're taking pictures, and then shoot a series of images at regular intervals. You know that's it's a whole this whole thing is a phase. It's, it's a process. It you know the moon's kind of flying through the sky, then all of a sudden when it crosses paths with the sun, if you've never seen the eclipse before, it's pretty remarkable. But you're going to see all of a sudden just a little circle of the sun start to disappear and that thing will progress and then all of a sudden we'll have totality where the sun or the moon completely covers up the sun all you can see is the ring of light around the sun and then it'll progress past that well i think a good a good uh practice would be to like the picture on the right take a uh, take a sequence of shots so you can show, show the whole progression now that picture there was done in post-processing i'm pretty sure that's how I would do it. So you're going to have all those individual pictures that you'll combine in, in like Photoshop or whatever your image editing uh, software of choice would be. You can combine at the end to show that whole sequence from when it begins to when it ends and then through totality. And then, of course, the picture in the middle or the picture on the left is of the sun in complete totality. And that's the point I'm told that, uh, and I, I keep saying this word, this phrase I'm told, I've never seen a to total eclipse before. And uh, I've only seen part. I've only seen a photograph partial eclipse, so this will be my first total eclipse. I've eclipse I've ever seen. But I'm told by people who have done it before during totality, you can take the filter off. And that's another reason why I recommended those cheaper slip-on filters instead of the screw-on ones, because when totality happens, you don't have a whole lot of time 
to try to get the picture. And so the less you can monkey with your camera and the less you're having to bump your camera, you can just slip one filter off, take the pictures and put it back on. I think the better off you're going to be in the long run. We just have less to mess with. And so with that said, here's some practice tips. And this is, you know, no one gets good at photography naturally. I mean, no one's born with an innate ability to take really cool pictures and stuff. It requires practice. It requires some doing over time. And so with that said, here's some practice tips. Practice early and practice often. We're right on the eve of this event happening. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 I don't know how often you can practice, but you can go ahead and start practicing as soon as we're done with this webinar today. I would take my stuff and go outside and start the process of looking up in the sky with your glasses on, finding the sun, getting everything lined up in your camera where you can compose the image well, get the focus locked in, get the settings right, do all that stuff, and then do it over and over again in the same practice session. You don't have to be out there for three or four hours a day, but I would at least spend half an hour a day if you're really serious about getting pictures. And the reason why is like a lot of things, whether we're talking sports or whether we're talking other genres of photography, you want that whole setup process to become muscle memory. So when it's time, when the day comes, when we've only got one shot at this, I mean, I guess the next eclipse will come around uh, in the, it's in, in the contiguous United States, the lower 48, I think it's 2044, but it's in Montana. But this one was in Montana and South Dakota, North Dakota, I think is what I read. But this one's covering such a big swath of the United States from southwest to northeast. Uh, this is the one that, and it's going over all the population centers. This is, the, this is our best shot for a while. And so practice, practice, practice. And uh, you'll, you'll be glad you did in the end because, again, you want that whole setup to become muscle memory. Take notes. Uh, put your notes down on your phone. Put your notes down on paper. In fact, I'll share something with you at the end of this, converse, at the end of this webinar on where you can download something to take notes on. And uh, but go out, practice early and practice often. Standardize your setup and your practice routine. What I mean by that is when I was in uh, when I was in high school, I played uh, I played baseball and I played basketball. And a lot of times, especially in preseason, we would do just pretty basic drills every day. But we do the same thing every single day and it became boring. But what it did was taught us those fundamentals that we needed when when the heat was on, when the pressure was on we could fall back on those fundamentals and really perform to the best of our ability at that time. Now I say standardize your setup. What I mean by that is use the same gear you're going to use the day of the eclipse. Don't practice with one set of gear today, then bring out another set the day of. Figure out what gear you're going to use right now. Get that gear set up, the same camera on the same lens, the same filters, the same tripod, all the same thing. So standardize that setup and practice with that same setup Every time you go out to practice, you'll be glad you did in the end. Also to that end, if you, no matter what kind of tripod you use, whether it's a, a three-way head or a ball head or a gimbal or whatever, make sure that all the knobs and stuff, you've got to orient it the same way every single time. And the thought there is, is when, you're, when, you, when the sun's moving to the sky and then you've got to adjust your camera to move, the last thing you want to do is look down and potentially miss something to be able to figure out where your knobs are because all of a sudden, and you know how it is if you've ever been in a pressure cooker situation, all of a sudden you kind of panic a little bit and then when you start to panic, you start to make mistakes. You turn the knob you shouldn't do or you 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 end up loosening your tripod, your ball head too much and your whole alignment gets out of the line and then you've got to start over again. So you don't want to do any of that. So set your tripod up where if you're shooting on a ball head, you, the uh, the main knob that controls the, the movement of the ball is in the same place each and every time. The knob that controls the panning on the head is in the same place each and every time. So sta standardize to that level. So again, you're trying to build muscle memory. When you go out to shoot pictures, you want that same setup to be the same every single time. And then, and then run through your practice routine. The same settings, the same gear, the way everything's set up, the way your trop, if you're going to sit down and watch it, practice setting down. If you're going to stand up while the eclipse is happening, practice with your tripod legs extended and setting up. If you're going to shoot with two camera rigs, put them both out, practice with them at the same time. And I know I sound like a broken record when I say all that, but I'm telling you, it'll pay off in the end. If you're, if you're practiced in all these movements, you won't miss much when the day comes. 
And then another thing I've been recommending to people is practice at the same at the time of the event. What I mean by that is uh, don't go out in the morning or in the evening and practice on the sun. If you have the ability, go out during the time of the day when the eclipse is going to happen. Like for us at my place in Texas, uh, the eclipse is going to start roughly, at, I think, about 1250 and then and then end up around three o'clock, oh, about around 1230, end up around three o'clock, about a about a two and a half hour time span. But totality is going to come there in the late one o'clock hour, like around 150, something like that. And so what I recommend to people is if you can go out and practice between today and then, which we get we're five days away, if you can practice during that time, practice during that same time. The reason why is because you'll get a feel for how fast the sun is moving through the sky and how often you have to reset and track this. If you don't have a tracker, like I don't think most of us have trackers, that you can just track your way, track the sun through the sky and you get a feel for that. If you do it in the morning, the sun's moving at such a different angle than it is during the day. Or if you do it in the evening, it's going to be the same way because the sun's pretty much going up or down at that time. And it's in relative, in relative to us, it looks like it's moving a little bit quicker than it is when it's straight overhead like it is going to be during the middle of the day. So I would practice at the same time every single day. Again, you're trying to replicate that game day situation. And so by practicing when it's going to happen, it's going to replicate that even closer, and you'll be able to get a good feel with how quick the sun's moving through the sky. And then the last practice tip is once you're done practicing, practice some more because that's I know I've been doing that every chance I get and just practicing the the whole setup because even though I'm teaching a workshop and I'm helping other people get ready, I need to be practiced as well. And so I think if you'll do that and follow those practice tips, then uh, you're going to be glad you did. And so with that, Derek, do we have any questions? Open the floodgates. We're going to start oh. with a question we already have in, Russell. The very okay. popular question of looking through the viewfinder. So Mark is asking, can you look through, through the viewfinder without the solar glasses? And well, I guess I'll start, I'll kick that over to you in saying there's two types of viewfinders, people. So optical and electronic EVF. So Russell, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. So I, I think if I understand the question, I've been looking through my viewfinder, but with the filter on the lens. And so if the filter is not on the lens, because if the filter is on the lens, uh, as best I can tell, it's the same thing as if you're wearing the solar glasses looking at it. You shouldn't receive any uh, bad effects from that. So you, I, I've been looking through the viewfinder. But it's a little easier for me instead of looking. I'll get my initial aim through the viewfinder, but then I'll, through the uh, eyepiece viewfinder, then I'll use the viewfinder on the back of the camera, uh, the screen on the back of the camera to start tracking after that. It's just easier for me because I've got a good aim with my eye. It's better muscle memory. I can look at what I'm shooting at and I can get it lined up better. So I, I, I look through the viewfinder first and then use the screen on the back of the camera to track it after that is what I've been doing on my practice routine. Yeah, for those of you using optical viewfinders, you're not going to want to look through because an optical viewfinder, you're basically looking through glass. You're looking through and there's no, you don't have that protection of that electronic screen. Um, so good practices. Not many people as compared to people using electronic viewfinders uh, for the mirrorless users. But if you're using an older camera, if you're using a DSLR, if you're using looking through an optical viewfinder, um, you're going to want to make sure that the lens has that solar protection on it and not look through there. Um, and, and, yeah, and go ahead, Russ. And, that, and, and that's, a good, that's a good reason, too, to shoot a, shoot a little bit looser because it's a lot easier to line up if you're not shooting at 800 millimeters from the beginning. So shoot it, you know, if you've got the zoom, shoot it. 100 millimeters and find it and then zoom in on it from there start wide and then zoom in on it once you find it it'll save you a lot of look and it makes it easier to find it on the back of the camera yeah on, and on your screen than it does looking through the viewfinder definitely and and i'll just go to your point that you said it's a great point about practicing in the same circumstances same time of day same kind of image that you're going to line up uh if you're not used to photographing these types of events or using these types of filters you're going to put that solar filter on and whether it's 16, 18, 20 stop, you're going to look through and you're going to be like, wait, is something, is my camera on? Is something wrong? You're going to bump your ISO up. You're going to turn your, your shutter speed way down and you're just going to see black. So you have to get used to what you're going to be looking at when you look through there. Practice in the same circumstances. You can't just throw the filter on and make sure everything's fine in your living room. 
you're not going to see anything. So yeah, it's a different, it's a whole different look. It took me, I mean, I've taken millions of pictures in my life and the first couple of times I did it, it was pretty foreign to me to, to get it all lined up just because those filters are so dark. You think your lens cap is on and then you realize, <laughs> Oh, it's not, you just got to get it right on the sun. And so it just takes, it takes a little bit of practice. That's Definitely. why I to practice, practice over and over again. Definitely. Now, this is a great question uh, because since we had our last couple workshops on the eclipse, we've had April Fool's. So uh, the path of totality, is it a finite thing? Every You know, you're seeing every time I come on and, and Google suggests seeing some articles I read, it's like, well, the path of totality is slightly changed. So visual mod modulations is asking, has the region of totality changed at all since the weekend or have I just fallen for a well-timed April Fool's Day prank? Uh, I, I don't, I hope it hasn't. I don't think, I don't think it has. <laughs> every, every map I look at is the same. Uh, it, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, and this is, again, I'm no expert on this. This is where I go back to the people a lot smarter than I am, but whoever did the math a long time ago, I've been seeing the same path of totality for, for the past three or four years since I, you know, when I finally, the light bulb went off, that it's going to be a right over my house. And so I hope it hasn't changed. I hope if it's changed any, it's shifted where I'm more under the middle of it and get a little bit longer to totality. So I would, I would almost sound, it almost sounds like a little bit of an April Fool's joke. So, but I'd have to see the map, <laughs> the map he saw to be for sure about that. Yeah. If it's, if there's any shift, it's kind of like any, anything else with, that's related to uh, atmosphere and weather, small, small, small shift. I don't think it's going to be anything um, from what I've seen. It's it's nothing that's going to change. I mean, the, the path of totality is going to be the path of totality. I think there's a little bit, um, from what I heard, a little bit a less, a little bit more of Texas getting a little bit longer totality in the uh, area of Ohio that might get a little less. I, don't, I think it's going to be negligible at best for the people who are worried. But yeah, that path of totality is pretty much not set in stone, but it's pretty, it's there. It's pretty solid. If, if you were in the path of totality six months ago or a week ago, you're going to be in the path of totality. I don't think that much will change. Um, I will say as my unsolicited advice, do not underestimate how short and how, you know, how short the period is and how fast it will go. Prepare yourself really, really, really follow all this preparation, calm yourself, enjoy it. But don't enjoy it so much. If you want to take pictures of it, don't enjoy it so much that you miss it because it will it will come and go. And and especially if you're in the path of totality, as Russell said, you're going to have to worry about um, taking the the filter off. So don't get don't get too caught up in the moment. You don't get any pictures, but don't get so caught up in taking pictures that you don't enjoy it. Um, Sandy is asking about this is another popular question using mobile phones. Um, people who are going to be shooting with iPhones. Their Androids, their their mobile devices, and I guess we'll lump this in with wide angle cameras because a lot of people are going to be photographing it with the phone, um, and a lot of people don't have super zoom capabilities on their phone. So for the people who are using wide angle lenses or cell phones, do we still need a filter? Yes, I would. I mean, if you're going to be looking at the sun, I would always use a filter. <laughs> if your device is going to be looking at the sun, I'd always use a filter. So. <laughs> I, I haven't really, I haven't tried it with my cell phone, but if I was going to try it with my cell phone and I, uh, I would, uh, I would, you know, I, I guess someone's making filters for those. I'm not aware of them, but if anything, I just use some of those cheap glasses. Like I talked about that look like the old school 3d glasses people used to wear at the movies, those cardboard glasses. I would at least put something like that in front of my, in front of my lens. I got a pair right here. Make sure that they are. There we go. Certified. Um, and also do not use filters, <laughs> do not use filters as glasses. I, I you say that more as a safety thing than anything else, but I know a lot of people are like, well, can I just look through? And it's like, it's not really recommended use glasses for the purpose of being glasses and use filters for the purpose of filtering your lenses and don't, you know, but if you do there, there are some DIY hacks, you know, uh, I know we've had s some people on who have use the filter, the sheet filters. So you can cut out custom cut out sheet filters. And there's a lot of information of that online where you can go and, and do some cool DIY stuff. Yeah. And you know, you can also do the, if you want to really experiment, I've done this before on partial eclipses before do the old pinhole camera experiment where you just poke mm -hmm. a, poke a hole in a piece of black cardboard or, or a poster board 
and be able to shine it on a piece of paper on the ground. And you can see the, the image. It's like the old camera obscura. You can see the image on the piece of paper on the ground. That's a pretty cool thing to do. One, mm. one thing I didn't mention as an aside on Hackberry Farm, uh, we love our chickens out there. And so the chickens are yard chickens. During the day, they just kind of roam around the place. But we're, I'm really interested to see what the chickens are going to do when the eclipse starts to happen. If they're going to think, oh, it's bedtime, and then go to roost, and then be in the roost for four minutes and come back out. So that's going to be pretty pretty neat to kind of see what they're going to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've heard in the past the the cows, cows will will react to it. And so it'll be, you'll have to let us know what yeah. happens around the farm, how the, how the animals respond to it. Uh, question from Rambo's join us from YouTube. Do we remove all other filters during the shoot? So is it just, are we just using a solar filter, taking everything off? And I'm going to kind of double this question up with another question we got in from Britain joining us on YouTube, asking about stacking filters. What do you recommend as far as filters? A lot of solar filters are going to start around F6, or F16, here I go again, uh, 16 stop filters. Do you recommend people stacking if they have a 10 stop and a 6 stop ND? Do you recommend stacking if you have a 16 stop filter? Do you recommend any other type of filters or should they try to use the minimal amount of filters between their glass and the eclipse? I think I think that's the correct approach is the minimal amount, minimal amount of filters between your glass and your, your eclipse filter. So in other words, if you've got a polarizer, I would take it off. If you've got a UV filter, I would take it off. I would, you know, I just I would just have between it's it's such an important event. The less things you have to mess with and the less things are going to complicate this whole setup for me is the better. You know, it's good, like to your point earlier, Derek. There's going to be a million things going on and you don't want to get in the panic and then miss something. And so I, I recommend as, as, as bare a minimum as you can get by to safely photograph the eclipse. That's what I would do. And one thing I want to dovetail on what you said before is, uh, you know, when you, when you live in, I'm not going to say just rural Texas, but probably rural everywhere where everyone's got a welder on the back of the truck and everybody, you learn how to weld as part of your high school curriculum. <laughs> everybody's got welders. Uh, you know, I'd mentioned, I think early on that I had, uh, before this started, I was talking to a guy and he was like, well, I'm going to use a welding helmet. And I'm, I'm like, that's not the, that's not the way to go. I, I think really uh, the, the key thing is to be safe. You know, it's, uh, it's, I'd rather miss a picture and keep my eyesight than I would the other way around. So uh, I think whatever filters you use, just make sure that they're, or glasses you use, make sure they're appropriate for the task at hand and, and, uh, you know, buy nothing to uh, I don't mean this uh, as an overt plug to B&H necessarily, but buy from a reputable shop that's going to sell you what you think you're getting. Because I know during times like this, there's always someone trying to knock something off, whether it's the glasses or whether it's the filters or whatever else. Make sure you know what you're buying. You buy from a reputable company and protect your gear, protect yourself ultimately. Definitely. We'll get a link dropped into the comments section for everybody because we do have a lovely consolidated area on our website landing page there for solar eclipse viewing photographing enjoying um so we'll get a link dropped into the comment section for everybody but everybody who needs to get those last minute things don't wait until the last moment uh i just picked mine up the other day from bnh so huge thank you to us for that frank is asking do you use a lens hood so i guess it depends on the type of filter you're using but with those slip-on filters, like I've been recommending to people, you can't mm -hmm. use a lens hood. So I take my, I take my lens hoods off and just put it right over the lens barrel, to try to get that filter as close as I can to to the lens element itself. Okay, yeah, and I, and I think with the solar filter on, you don't really. It's going to cut down on the artifacting that you're going to be getting in anyway. So the solar right. filter yeah, is I, gonna is gonna trump the 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 lens hood. Yeah, I don't think you need it at that point. Yeah. Legendary Alex joining us on YouTube. I'm going to be paying attention to this one because I will be in New York City. Any tips to photograph the partial eclipse? Alex will be photographing it from a rooftop in New York, looking south and thinking of shooting wide enough to get a nice city shot in there. So I would be looking at that two ways because I've been thinking about the same thing, uh, Legendary Alex. I've been thinking, how do we photograph this where we're... we're I, I've got some options on the end. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about, and you may want to try, and you can try it today even with the, just the sun. Of course, you're going to want to have the filters on. But think about composites. You know, can you do like a like a, a dusky kind of sunset with a, with, and then be able to 
do a composite later on with the partial eclipse in that frame or or can you pre-shoot some stuff during the day and then and, you know with a good well-lit foreground that kind of is a facsimile of the way the light's going to look and the way the light's coming from the same direction of the of the manhattan you know i'm just thinking out loud i've been to manhattan before but i don't know what part of manhattan he lives in of say the skyline kind of kind of flowing out before you light it at the similar time of day and then do a composite when you get the, the partial eclipse in there and be able to blend both of those together so that's what i've been thinking about so you may he may want to go ahead and build him a library of, of uh, just foreground images in the beginning i know when i do when i do and i'm and i'm taking a lesson there from uh, when I do, a lot of times when you do Milky Way photography or you're doing uh, Star Trail photography or you're doing Firefly photography, you're taking kind of a base shot where you can see a little more detail and you're blending that with other shots to kind of create the sky. It's like a super HDR in the end. So I recommend them trying something like that. Yeah, definitely. And and Alex, if you have photo pills, use photo pills. They have a wonderful augmented reality um, tool in there that I use for the moon. Uh, you can kind of just hold it up. You're probably not going to be able to, to see it on here, but it has an actual augmented reality map on there that will allow you to place it. So you can go out to Hudson Yards and just hold up the augmented reality and see where things are going to fall. And there's a ton of different options in there. I haven't played around with it to see how it's going to play for lining up a photo of the solar eclipse. I intend to. I will also be in that area. So uh, if I do get any tips, I will drop them to our B&H audience there. But uh, yeah, start figuring out now. I think that's a great point, Russell, going back to that last question, is thinking outside the box. Not everybody's going to be in the, the range of totality. So start thinking outside the box as far as lining up uh, interesting compositions finding things that are going to be in your path, in your direct area that are going to make for interesting environmental elements to, to work this into your image. Right. Yeah. So I, I did a similar shot. I should have put it in here, but I did a similar shot. I'm trying to think my kids were little, my kids are, are now 19 and 23, but they were probably 12 and eight at the time. So 10 years ago or so we had a partial eclipse that happened in the evening. And so I went out and scouted a spot where I could have a windmill in the same frame as that partial eclipse. So the windmill was silhouetted and then the partial eclipse was behind it. So, uh, but that just took kind of thinking ahead and figuring out where I wanted to be. And that's a good tip. What you said, using tools like photo pills and that augmented reality to help you kind of visualize what it's going to look like day of, because even during the part, well, even during all but four minutes of the total eclipse, you're still going to have kind of that dusky sort of look to the to the to the scene i mean it's not going to be completely black you're still going to have some you know some kind of 10 minutes before sunset kind of light filtering in across the landscape so uh i i, I think that's what i would do it is just try to think think in terms of in terms of doing a composite overall okay perfect and kind of staying with that we did have a a question about that when is it safe to remove the filter and the glasses for viewing for the people who are in the path of totality. Because at that point, the sun is completely covered up by the moon. Now, if it wasn't a total eclipse, it's not. If it's a, if it's uh, an annular eclipse, then you still need to leave the filter on. But because if it's a so if it's a total eclipse, like we're going to have the, the entire circumference of the sun will be covered up by the entire circumference of the moon that's why this eclipse is is so special because it's not you know you have eclipses every year but it's not every year that you have uh, a situation where the where the moon is at the perfect distance away the earth is at the perfect distance away from the sun and the moon is at the right place in the sky to completely block out the sun and so I, I always think of I would I call it like the uh, like the 1990 sound garden song black hole sun that's what it's going to look like so it'll it'll be just a complete black disc in the sky, and so the flares that you'll see around that black disc won't be so bright where you can't just take the the filter off your off your lens at that point. Yeah, the early MTV generation will get that reference. You couldn't go a day without seeing that music video. I know it's great. So um, let's see. We're looking for some more questions here. We got a couple minutes. If you guys do have any questions. Feel free to get them in. We've had a couple questions coming in on bracketing. Um, various, there's various 
moments during the eclipse that are things kind of get a little ambiguous, I guess you could say, when when you have the the shift where it really starts to to move into that total eclipse where you have it's you know obviously way before the clips you're working with a different set of light during the the totality you're working with that darkness and you're getting that full eclipse but in those in between moments when you get the beads and and you get the um you know the the various in between stages do you bracket at all um do you have any advice for best settings or best practices not for totality and not for in the early stages but in those in between moments where it's not fully dark and not fully bright. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, part of it goes back to just practice. I would, I was having this conversation with someone yesterday. I think it's a, if you know your camera well, it's probably not a bad idea to go change one of your buttons on your, if you shoot mirrorless, to just your, your bracket settings, just so you can get to it quick. You know, and I think you can do that on most cameras. I think you've got the ability to just to press a quick button. It'll take you to that setting. And then, you know, depending on, the model camera you have, whether it'll do a three, you know, three stop sequence, five stop, seven stop sequence. I think some of the cameras will do seven stops. Uh, just go ahead and get that pre-dialed in. And then that way, when it comes time to bracket and you can, you know, you'll be able to monitor and kind of see when things are getting a little bit wanky. But when it comes time to bracket, and that's usually going to be kind of in that area, right when you start to go to go to totality and then right when you're coming out of totality, when things are going to get kind of weird for your camera. So just to be able to do that instantly and be able to, to switch into that quickly is going to be paramount without taking your, your eyes off the screen. And so that's where it goes back to practice. Uh, pra practice that setup and just kind of run through that routine. In your mind, you know, tomorrow when you're out practicing, you're seeing the sun go into totality and then and then reach down, change that bracket setting, kind of roll through it, and then, and then uh, take the filter off. I mean, you're, you're to me, in my mind, I'm practicing the same way I'm going to be shooting that day. I'm going through all the motions. Uh, luckily for me, I don't, I mean, I live in the country and I, you can't see any houses from where I live. So my neighbors won't worry about what I'm doing when I'm out there kind of doing the same thing every single day. But I would encourage you to, to go out there and practice all of those movements and even have, if you need to have a checklist, uh, put it on your phone. There's an app. I'll just tell you what it's called. And I don't, I'm not, well, I have to turn my phone on. So while I'm doing that, I'm not affiliated with this guy in either way. Uh, but I, there's a YouTube channel called smarter every day. And this, this guy did a, uh, it's a really good channel. This guy did a video about the eclipse about a month ago. And he met with the, one of the world's preeminent authority or one of the nation's preeminent authorities on the solar eclipse. And he developed an app that'll give you verbal clues. So you don't have to sit there and stare at your phone the whole time. He'll give you verbal clues during the different phases of the eclipse. So that way you can keep your eyes on the eclipse or keep your eyes on the camera. And uh, I've downloaded it. And it seems to me like it's a, it's going to be a pretty good uh pretty good app but it's called the solar eclipse timer pretty pretty simple perfect and again it'll it'll when it comes time it'll tell you the different phases you're looking at and give you a, give you a heads up of when the totality is about to start and it's all going to be based on you know where your your location of course definitely and we'll we'll yeah. get to one last question here joe mismo joining us on youtube this is a great question i'm, kind of, I'm going to kind of expand the question here i know you went into focal lengths uh, a little bit during your presentation, but Yo Mismo is asking, which teleconverter should I use, a 1.4 time or a two time? So I kind of want to expand that question into, with a teleconverter, obviously you're losing stops of light, not a problem. You're losing a little bit of quality. Generally, it's usually negligible. Is Do you recommend opting for a longer focal length without a tell you know, are, are taking a shorter focal length without a, a teleconverter or do you think that adding the length with the teleconverter is it going to be worth anything you would lose any quality would use is, do you recommend one versus the other do you have any thoughts on using teleconverters i you know i do and this kind of comes back to my simplistic approach i i think what you what you let off with was exactly right you're going to lose a stop a lot you're going to lose a little bit of quality I think for this case, for me, the less things I can have set up to go wrong, the better. And so, you know, teleconverters are, are, are part mechanical, the way they connect, they're, they're all electronic, the way they connect, they've got a lot of glass in them. It's another point of failure. So what I would recommend instead is if you're going to shoot, let's say 500 millimeters, 
the if you've got a modern camera, these cameras are so good, you can crop a little bit to get that same focal length you would get otherwise. Or alternately, if you've got a mirrorless camera, or I know some of the late the uh, the late model like a like a Nikon D850, for example, where they have a DX mode you can go into. Go to your crop mode inside your camera, pre-crop it in your camera. You, you don't lose any quality of the megapixels you have left. It'll be a smaller file size in the end, but you can accomplish that uh, without a teleconverter if you want to go ahead and pre-crop in the camera using your crop mode. That's what I would recommend. I would probably tend to leave the teleconverter off just because, again, it's another something else that can go wrong. I'm trying to make my setup as lean as I can with as few of things that can go wrong as it can. And so that way, for in my mind, if something does go wrong, I can troubleshoot just a couple of things and know what the what the issue is without really kind of throwing my brain into a frenzy thinking, well, is it the teleconverter, is it the lens? I mean, is it the camera? What is it? It's just one one less point of failure to deal with. So that that's my opinion on that. Wonderful. I mean, it seems like keeping it simple, enjoying it, practice. Although if you're in New York, we've had four thousand straight days of rain. So practice <laughs> doesn't work for us for us. Sorry, sorry to those of us in the tri-state area, but Really, I mean, that's what I gathered from this. It's really just about keeping things simple, minimizing your your risk for having errors, mm -hmm. and enjoying it, preparing. Yep. Yep. Awesome. That pretty much sums it up. Sounds good. Well, Russell, I want to thank you for your expertise, your time. As always, uh, if you guys want, we'll drop a link to what Russell has going on down there at Hackberry Farms, doing a lot of great things down there, and he has become a staple on the event space channel over on YouTube. So make sure you head over to our channel on YouTube and check out this and all of our other live recorded content. Russell, any closing words? That's it. Just enjoy. And, uh, and I can't wait to see everybody's pictures. So, uh, if you don't, if you don't mind, one thing I always do is share my email address. I always, uh, answer emails when people send them. Sometimes it may take me a day or two, no matter, depending on where I am, but, uh, I always like to see people's pictures and engage with people because Derek, there's a lot of photography enthusiasts in Manhattan and New York City, but you're looking at the only member of the Dodge City, Texas Camera Club right here. So if you give me a chance to talk photography with other people, I'm always going to take advantage of it. So I appreciate it. There you go. I keep telling you one day I'm going to make it down there. I got to come, come visit. Got to visit the farm, man. C come on. We're ready for you. There we go. Well, huge thank you to Russell again and to all of our viewers out there. Can't wait to see what you guys photograph with this upcoming eclipse. Plug us on. Plug us on in on it too. We want to see what you're photographing as well. But that is all we have for you. Another edition of the B Nature Event Space now in the books. Catch y'all next time. Thank y'all.